And that's exactly what happened in my journey. For 24 years, I held a secret. Now, if you hold a secret that you know is going to traumatize you, it's inevitable that you're going to go through life with some struggle from a psychological perspective. But the big thing in my journey of recovery, when I look back, it's the people that actually disclosed to me gave me permission to be vulnerable. And I think that's why I'm so passionate about peer support, lived experience, storytelling to go, we're not really that different. You know, a lot of us, doesn't matter what country we live in, we appreciate some pretty crappy moment in life. But the good thing is that we are pretty resilient and in time and with support, you can get through it. Hi, I'm Nicole Sharanam and welcome back to Connectedly. So today we are talking with Jules Haddock, an accomplished conversationalist in mental health education who shares her own struggle with mental health rooted in a traumatic childhood experience. If you've ever been struggling with mental illness or you struggle to define what mental illness even is, then this one's for you. And why are we laughing so hard? What is so funny? And how laughing might be able to help? Please join us. Before we kick off, if you want to be part of the conversation, just email me or you can join our group on Facebook called the Women's Happiness Movement. Link will be in the show notes. So Jules Haddock has an engaging and creative approach in helping communities to understand mental illness and how to manage the invisible learning blocks and walls often confronted in learning expeditions. She takes the myths about mental illness and weaves participants into developing safe and confident-based approaches that can be used in supporting and maximising confidence in the space for both teacher and learner. With gaiety and passion, she introduces us into an awareness mental health literacy, recovery, and the importance of embracing strength-based and person-centered learning for each student. Hi, Jules. It's so nice to connect with you face-to-face, even though we're not the physical yes. world. I have, you know, it's so nice to have you here in front of me. How are you? I, I'm actually very good. I just came back from a yoga session, so that was very nice. Cool. Uh, Oh, half your life. Yeah. Um, I didn't do my yoga today and I need to do more yoga. So thank you for that inspiration. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, tell me a little bit about what you do. Let's introduce you to the audience. Oh, wow. Well, well outside being a, a mum of four, we have a blended family, three biological kids of my own. I have a business called The Anxious Bird. And so by profession, I'm a mental health educator. And predominantly, I run mental health first aid and do, do stuff in the education system with businesses, just just really improving people's conversational confidence. But the other thing I do is I'm president and founder of Art of the Minds, which is something I think we'll talk more about later. But I also have developed a program um, called Wheel of Recovery, which I'll be launching sort of next year. And I work also at Foundation 61, which is the soon-to-be-opened eight-bed facility for women with uh, substance use issues here in Mount Dunedin. Oh. But my exciting news is I've recently become a laughter yoga instructor. So, Ooh. yeah, watch the space there. Even just saying that makes me laugh. <laughs> well, I know. It's, it's quite it, – I did a lot of sort of evidence-based research all around it, and it's it's really exciting. So. Uh, for those people around Surf Coast uh, Shire area, you'll have to watch for um, Laughter Yoga that's going to be starting next year. Um, but look outside that, you know, I'm I, in my spare time, I'm an artist, I paint and do a lot of sculpture. Actually, that's my real, real love. And I'm also a carer. Our youngest son, who's 22, is on the autistic spectrum. So uh, I guess that's me, you know, um, I live and breathe the conversation around mental health uh, myself mm-hmm. and uh, you know with that I'm a person with lived experience which I can share more about soon yeah please like what a wow like what a smorgasbord of skill sets and projects and I yeah. actually feel really quite honored that I get to sit here with someone who is so passionate clearly because you wouldn't be doing all these things if you weren't passionate about this subject matter and and I would like to delve into that. Why is mental health such a big thing for you specifically? 
look, you know, it really comes down to the fact that I'm a person with lived experience of um, mental illness. And I think by default, um, you know, hanging on and not not knowing the journey I was going to go on was what really brought me into the space today, which I absolutely love. Uh, you know, when I was young and I had been sexually violated, so I didn't share that with anyone. And of course, that's going to see the consequences, particularly what we know about our brain development and vulnerabilities, you know, to experiences in the environment have, you know, it was without doubt, it was either crumble or rise, you know, and in that journey, I became curious about what we call recovery for myself, but then thought, this is too good. I've got to share this with everybody else. That's what I do now. Yeah. Wow. Well, firstly, I have to say, I'm so sorry for your experience. What a, what a horrendous thing to occur. But for all those people who understand and who need your message, thank you for speaking and thank you for sharing because it is huge. It's so important that all of these messages get shared with those who feel like they're in the dark with this stuff, yeah. you know? And that, that, that's exactly what happened in my journey. You know, for 24 years, I held a secret. Now, if you hold a secret that you know is going to traumatise you, uh, I guess, you know, it's inevitable that you're going to go through life with some struggles, you know, from a psychological perspective. But, you know, the, the big thing in my journey of recovery, when I look back, it's the people that actually disclosed to me gave me permission to be vulnerable. And I think that's why I'm so passionate about peer support, lived experience, storytelling to go, we're not really that different. You know, a lot of us, doesn't matter what country we live in, you know, we, we appreciate some pretty crappy moments, you know, in life and experience them. But, you know, the good thing is that we are pretty resilient and, and in time and with support, you can get through it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Talk us a little bit about kind of your journey and and how you the ups and downs of that. Like, what does that look like for someone? And what were your coping mechanisms? Well, it's interesting because I am affiliated with a a community and research network and Deakin Impact who are always sort of studying, you know, what it is that causes mental illnesses and, you know, how we can manage that. And I know that sort of post- the trauma that happened to me when I was young that, you know, there was some great factors that really helped me get through that, like growing up in the outdoors. You know, we know nature lowers cortisol levels, which is great for an anxious kid. Uh, being able to swim in a pool, which I still love water today. Um, but I think, you know, there was some really great connections, people that didn't know what had happened, but they instilled in me a sense of safety, especially my nana. You know, and I'll be forever grateful for Nana Bird, as we call her. But, you know, the big thing for me was actually art. You know, when I look back, I'm so pleased I have parents that were really creative and encouraged that because I now know that was how I expressed emotion and and feelings when I was young. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to someone out there that's going through the thick of it now, whether, whether it be similar story to yours or whether it be someone that's just you know, having, uh, you know, don't they don't really know what's going on with their mental health. They just know that something's not right. Yeah. Well, I think if you feel like buttons are getting pressed, you know, that kind of tells you there's, there's something deep in your inner soul that, you know, is saying there's some unfinished business. Um, but I would sort of really encourage the message that, you know, people are really, it doesn't matter where you live as saying, this instance being a woman, you know, it's it sadly is an experience that can happen to anyone in any country. Uh, and you need to remind yourself of that. I mean, it's, it's actually about self-compassion therapy that you're not alone and that you deserve, you know, to go back and, and just restore and experiment and become curious and and be very forgiving. I think that was one of the hardest things I found for myself as a mother, you know, when I didn't realise what my major diagnosis, I had a couple of different episodes of different types of mental illnesses before I was diagnosed, clinically diagnosed with um, yes. very severe post-traumatic stress disorder. And I guess getting that diagnosis, I became really curious. And But before that, 
I just muddled through life. You know, I, I often have, when I'm speaking to groups, you know, I have a picture of this beautiful line that goes, I disclosed and everything went like this. Well, it sort of went more like this. Just this yeah. crazy. So being really forgiving on yourself because we can only do the best we can, but definitely reach out for help because you're not alone in this journey. Mm, gosh, so where does someone start? I mean, I've been quite fortunate to say that I've never been diagnosed with any form of mental illness. But having said that, I mean, how, how do you even know? There's many people in this world that, that, that are either highly stressed or they end up you know, lying in bed for a month because they feel like they're too sad to get up, but they don't necessarily have a formal diagnosis. So when do you kind of know? Where's the tipping point of, I need help? What would you say to those people that are struggling but aren't necessarily under a diagnosis? Well, I think that in in the circumstances of looking at what a mental illness is, you know, it's an illness that affects our thoughts, our emotions and our behaviour but will also be persistent and it will affect our functioning. So if you look at your life and go, well, I'm not doing my hobbies and interests anymore. They're not giving me a buzz. Mm. I haven't got the energy. I just want to hide under the doona or keep really busy. You know, that's the other side. I mean, I've also been diagnosed with ADHD. So that's why I do so many projects. <laughs> um, but, I, but I think it's really important to find a doctor uh, who you really feel comfortable crying in front of. And that sounds really weird, but, you know, that was really important to me. I didn't want to walk out feeling ashamed to release emotions. And no one had ever in my journey of recovery said this to me, but I discovered this myself, was the gender was really important. And now where possible, I just see female doctors or female psychologists, you know, so I think if you want to even start at scratch, some advice I was given when I first had to share my story, which is, was at a sexual assault unit, which you can go directly there. There's sexual assault units all across Australia. And remember, they're hearing your story three million times over. So there's a sense of safety mm -hmm. sort of in that. But I actually wrote, my, I wrote down what had happened um, and I destroyed that. Well, I actually didn't destroy that letter. I gave it to somebody, but you could destroy that letter. But I think it's really st important to start getting that story out of mm. And I love what you said about, you know, being vulnerable and, and being able to allow that to come up because I can imagine you really do want to feel like you're in a safe space to be able to do that, right? And and there would probably be a lot of shame that you would carry. Do, you know, is it okay to even do that? Like uh, there'd be so many thoughts running through your head on top of everything else, you know? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the, the interesting thing with children that experience trauma who then become adult women, you carry a sense of guilt, um, and that could be, you know, parents separating. Children just have this way of seeing it as their fault. And I definitely, I did that for years. I was terrified to disclose. And finally, I was actually sitting in a psychology class where someone noticed a reaction when the lecturer announced we were going to be looking at unprocessed childhood trauma like sexual violation. That's all I heard. But I, I had a panic attack and it was that girl Amanda who was sitting next to me that that at the end of the class said are you okay and there's a whole little story there people can read my full story on my website mm. but she actually shared with me in that moment that sh that had happened to her and the weight of not feeling so alone was so powerful you know and really encouraged me to go forward uh, into that journey of healing Oh my gosh, I'm I've just broken out in absolute goosebumps. What a what a really amazing story that you had that you had someone there to connect with, to really open up to. I think that is such a a gift, really. Yeah. Um, so I guess that is a good segue for us. You know, I, we talk a lot about connection on this podcast. It's since it's called Connectedly. <laughs> So how important do you think connection is in healing and in working through mental illness? Uh, number one, essential. And it doesn't mean you have to have a bevy of three million people around you, 
But, you know, if you look at, I mean, everyone experienced, you know, isolation during COVID, particularly in the city sort of areas, probably more so than us in the regional and rural. But, you know, if you go back to war, isolation was used as a form of torture because it made this sick, which is mental illness, you know, was Mm. happening. Um, And often when I deliver mental health first aid, you know, I talk about psychosocial connection. And it's, you know, although we can, you know, learn all about ourselves and what our minds need, which is what my Recovery Will program is about, and tailor that to self, people need people. You know, we were not designed to be isolated. And we know that does make you mentally really challenged. And then, you know, when you say that and you talk about COVID and you talk about we are obviously Surf Coast Shire here and whilst we're not completely rural, there are people that are living further out on farms that aren't necessarily having a neighbour right next door they can just walk to. And even if they did, they sometimes still feel isolated. And what what would you say as someone who works in the community space a lot, you know, this subject matter, what would you kind of say to a community what can we do to help those people? Do we have some sort of responsibility to be able to connect more with those people? How do we, How do? because we don't know who they are. So how do we do this as a community? Well, I think that's where the really creative programs come in. Like I know that all my life I've loved exercising on my own, yet I love going to a yoga studio. Uh, for some people, they go to book clubs. For some people, it might be the local community house but I think that even if you have a neighbor that you know just doesn't get out of their house much or if they do they're just running for the bins and the the mailbox having those quick conversations with people you know can be a game changer and I often say to people when I'm in you know instructing people to become mental health first aiders that you don't have to have the whole journey with a person it might be one kind word that you say to somebody or give them five minutes of your time, but that actually got them through that day. Mm, Yeah, I do remember during the COVID times and when we were covered up with masks and we couldn't see smiles, I do remember that it lost that little uh, connection piece we had, you know, and I remember that moment that masks were taken off and just to see that person down the street, the complete stranger, just to smile at them again, that, that huge amount of connection that could happen just from that for me was priceless, yeah, really yeah. like priceless and life-changing for some, for, especially for people who don't connect with anyone, you know, so important. And I think too, you know, the nature of a mental illness like depression or anxiety will inhibit people connecting. But the guts of the recovery model or one of the major principles is you, you've got to take responsibility, you know, it, whether you want to hear it or not, you know, you have to look in the mirror and say, well, I don't like my life, but if I don't do something about it, nobody else can change it because we can't, you know, you can lead a horse to water, you can't make a drink. So I think, you know, there's an element of what the community can do for connectedness, but you have to take responsibility to seek that connectedness as well. And sometimes that just has to be baby steps. Yeah, because I can just, I mean, as I said, I don't know personally, but I can imagine when I'm personally feeling, you know, yucky about something or I'm angry or I'm sad or whatever it is, and I think of my most heightened emotion at my worst time, I don't necessarily want to be around people. Yeah. But I can imagine if you're feeling like that 24-7, of course, you. I agree with you, you've got to be responsible, but how do you cross that barrier of, okay, I'm going to try and connect with someone today I I imagine that's like a nightmare well I think that's the the premise of my profession it's about educating people about mental illness because unless you know what happens with this ball on our shoulders it can be very hard to get out of the the state you're in Um, and I always use the analogy like you know if anyone's cooking today and you cut your finger with a knife Well, you'd know exactly what to do. You'd know whether you need professional help or whether you can manage that with a Band-Aid or, you know, cold water. But when it comes to mental health, you know, people have no idea how the brain works, you know. Mm. Like, for example, in one day, 60,000 thoughts go through our 
brain in one day. And, you, you know, neuropsychologists have said that 97% of those thoughts trigger an emotional res response, mm. which trigger a behavioural response. And we know what mental illness loves to do. It loves to get in on those thoughts where, one, they become a little bit self-critical, toxic, negative, but we also start to believe them because thoughts are actually not necessarily true. They're real, but they're not true. And until people start to learn more about mental illness, you know, it can be really difficult to go, wow, I see why I need to take responsibility. It's like going to the gym. If I go to the gym, I'm not going to have one session and be fit. Therefore, maybe I need to see a psychologist to help me rethink my life. Does that mm -hmm. kind of make sense? It does. And it was saying, so someone that's cut their finger, they would know when they need to get help to, to fix it, right? Yes. How do they know when they need help with their too many thoughts and triggers? What is there like a line in the sand that you go, okay? Yeah. Well, I think for um, myself, you know, looking at the journey of recovery, we have to expect relapses. And it's basically where you are walking through life, everything's fine and you slip and fall back. Um, and often you'll get yourself back up again, but you slip and fall again. And I know for myself, I got tired of being tired. I got tired of falling. Mm -hmm. And I think your quality of life, you really are honest with yourself. Your quality of life, uh, your friendships, your connections, you know, you'll have this sense that everything's okay. And And sometimes, you know, with mental illness, we just need to tweak. You know, it's a bit sort of like, getting rid of the gut before summertime, we start yeah. doing sit-ups, you know. And, well, I don't. I could just go to yoga <laughs> and hope they do something that gets rid of the gut before Christmas. Um, so I kind of think, you know, it's not always gloom and doom. And, and the journey of learning about yourself, embrace it. I'm so curious. I constantly experiment. With myself, I look at the latest, you know, what are they saying now? So last year, my husband goes, what have you bought on online shopping this time? And it was an infrared sauna because oh. there's some evidence to say it helps with depression, anxiety. Um, but I know being a person with ADHD, it's a great place for me to go and be still and read my book and just be mm. quiet. Mm. How does your brain go with being quiet when you have ADHD? Well, you can rewire your brain. And I think that's the premise of, you know, when you're feeling really flat, you know, you don't have to stay in that state. You know, sometimes people need some medication to help them lift out of the swamp, if you like, or lower the, the chatter of the trains of thought. Um, but I guess that we have the ability to rewire ourselves, and you have to put the work in so a little exercise like three times a day being grateful is like doing a little mm -hmm. weight lift for your brain yeah putting yeah. your phone away you know how many people sit on the couch with their phone at night mm -hmm. you know I always say the world will never end because my neighbor peeks through the window and she'll come and tell us anyway it does but <laughs> So it's all these little <laughs> strategies and that that's how I developed the recovery wheel. I looked at science, mm -hmm. I looked at my own life and that program is about h helping people to explore themselves, share things they've tried, uh, be curious, you know, all based on the science, you know, around that. Tell me tell me more about your program. So so that's you said it's going to start what next year? Is that right? Well, it's actually been trialled. We tried it with um, trialled it with WHR Allied Health, and all the participants did what's called a DAS twenty one. So it's a psychological tool um, that measures stress, depression, and anxiety. Uh, we ran it over nine weeks for one hour, uh, or approximately an hour on Zoom each week, same time, and each week there's a different topic. I'll deliver on some educational, evidence based facts around why researchers have proven this is good and the rest of the time is sharing with each other what works for you what you might go and trial the following week um, everyone in that first research group the levels of stress 
depression, anxiety dropped after 10 weeks. Wow. You know. Wow. Um, because it's kind of like boot camp for the brain, if you like, mm. you know. And so are those people that, that join your program or that you're looking to have join your program, are they people that are already struggling with mental illness or just stress and, ang- and, and anxious, you know? Well, I mean, our first cohort were people with diagnosed mental illnesses, but it could, right. that's the other thing about education. I don't know how many people have told me they're, they're just really stressed. And then when I ask them more about symptoms around anxiety um, as a, you know, diagnostic symptoms, they're experiencing anxiety disorders that are treatable, mm. you know. So wow. I guess um, see what happens there. I'm happy to be open. You know, I kind of feel if any, mm. anyone's ch- being challenged mentally, well, it's going to be a good outcome regardless of whether it was a clinical diagnosis or not, yeah. you know. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit more about this, the misunderstanding or myths of mental illness. Tell me a little bit more about that. Is there something you can shed some light on that for us? Well, I think it's it's kind of like a, when when I do training, I get everyone to do this exercise where I get them to stand on one foot, imagining that leg's your brain. And when the foot goes down, you've actually put your foot into mental illness. Now, we know from Australian data that that many people meet the criteria for a mental illness, but they get themselves out of it and then say, mm-hmm. I've never experienced a mental illness because of the ignorance in education. You know, we all know the COVID symptoms, but if I said, tell me the nine symptoms of depression, the average person might go, sad, Mm. you know. Mm. And nine symptoms isn't a lot of symptoms to remember, you know. Uh, I mean, if you look at stigma, um, Mm. I think that stops a lot of people. You know, there's notions that you can't, you know, how many people get a job and then it says, have you had a pre-existing illness and you might have had depression, but oh, we better not tick that one, mm. you know, um, whereas, you know, if it was a bad back or something, you might tick it. But mm. I guess people, uh, many people are still stuck in the myth that you, if you have a mental illness, you can't be an effective mum, you can't be a great partner, mm. you can't operate or function at work, that the answer is time off. And it's often not time off. It might need some workplace Mm. modifications, but sometimes having time off for someone can be the worst thing. So I think Mm. it's about battling the stigma, particularly for women not saying, oh, there's someone worse than me. You know, you hear that. Uh. Or I'm too busy to worry about myself, you know, and... That, again, that comes back to that self-compassion that I'll put the I'll put the kids, the family, parents, everybody else before me, but I'll come last at a cost. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so something's just come to me as we were talking. I think I think for our listeners, there's probably many, many women out there, as you said, that I think exactly the same way that you've said, that just go, look, I know I'm a bit sad or I'm a bit lost my appetite or I'm, you know, I think we need to go through those nine things of depression, the nine signs of depression. I think that would be helpful so that listeners can potentially go, okay, tick, 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 and then look at next steps. All right, you're going to, you're going to test me here now because I've, rem- oh. I've got to remember them all. <laughs> but generally the top two are um, a feeling of sadness that will not go away. You know, it just will not go away and there can be no explanation for it. So if you do a tick list, it's like, why am I feeling like this? Because according to my objectives and how I wanted my life to be, it is how I want it to be, yet I still feel this sense of gloom or despair. Now, the other thing you'll generally see all of the time is a lack of interest in hobbies and or interests, I guess. Uh, mm-hmm. So even if you watch a movie, you don't even process the movie. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, for some people, because you need to experience five uh, symptoms on average for two weeks to have your toe in depression. So for some people, right. you will see a lack of um, concentration, uh, inability to sort of process information, information. For others, it'll be your sleep is start sabotage. Either you sleep too much and you can't get enough sleep, you're exhausted, 
or you just can't sleep. You're, you're exhausted, but you really struggle to get a good night's sleep. Generally, appetite you'll see go either way. People lose weight or they put weight on. That's a bit mm. of that, I guess, self-medication. Mm. Um, it's very common with depression for people to have suicidal thoughts, which, uh, you know, often fright, frighten people when I say that. Um, but, you know, it makes sense. If I'm feeling gloom and doomy and I've got 60,000 trains going through my head of thought, of course one's going to be, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that's a crisis. Yeah. I often joke mm -hmm. and say, I've sometimes thought of uh, killing my husband, but I never follow through on it <laughs> yet. <laughs> and you can oh, see psychomotor um, skills, so people can feel really tired or they can become really agitated. Um, mm. That'll do. But that gives you an idea. It feels like, they're it feels like a lot. At, yeah, and they're probably, and withdrawal, it's very common. Um, mm. common for people to withdraw, just not have the capacity to connect. Um, and mm. similar with anxiety disorders, the, the, it, it will inhibit your capacity to connect. And both anxiety and depression are more prevalent in women in Australia. Wow, I didn't, I didn't know that. Mm. Okay. What do you do now? I'm, cu <laughs> I'm curious, do, do we know why that is? What's your suspicion on that? Well, we know anxiety disorders are going up since the introduction of social media. But, I mean, the, you know, I read a lot of sort of theories and Gabor Mate is my latest book sort of I'm reading at the mm. moment. And he has a belief that in some ways our brains are pre-wired as children to be be susceptible with certain environment influences to anxiety, depression, even, even ADHD, for example, um, because he believes the brain doesn't wire itself properly, um, particularly if a young child has experienced abuse. And this is no parent blaming now at all, mm -hmm. because often if you look at those cycles, we learn how to parent from our parents who learn how to parent from their parents. Uh, so it could be that, you know, there's a bit of nature, nurture involved and society as it is today, you know, women do not get a break yeah. from word go. You're juggling kids, you've got to work. The research actually says that women, although it's really nice to say, oh, men are doing their share fair in the house, women are still the predominant housekeepers, if you like, mm. if you look at it in that heterosexual sort of um, framework, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, often, often what happens is that n of no fault of the parents, you know, kids go to daycare, they go to be looked after, and then that cycle continues in parenting. Um, and going back to the brain, they believe that for the first 1,000 days of a child's life, the best thing you can do is attune. So we can love our kids, but there's a difference between attuning to a child. And that's saying to my child, with my eyes, with my behaviour, I see you, I hear you. And, and unfortunately, I think lifestyle makes that really hard for, for women, particularly when they're running around like little rabbits, as we all do. Oh my gosh, it's so true. I, I actually got a bit emotional then because I try not to play into that mum guilt thing, but we all do it to ourselves at some point. You know, we all have that moment where we go, I've got this, I have to do. And your, your daughter or your child's pulling on your sleeve and you're like, stop. And and we've all had that. It makes me get quite emotional yeah. that we all have to keep believing that we are doing our best and, and we are, no matter where we are at, we are doing our best. We really are. Um, but I wonder then... What advice, I've got kind of two questions coming out of my brain right now, which is kind of better than five, I guess. But um, what could you say to a mother to help with their kids through this? Is there something we can do? Like, I, I obviously you've said, see your kid. Is there something else you would say? Because as it is difficult for us when we're running around and we're busy and we've got lots to do. Is there something on the top of your mind that you'd go, yeah, try this? Well, I've had historically heard, because uh, Mental Health First Aid is a two-day course, I always give homework and the homework is you have to do something for yourself. And many women will come back and go, I just didn't have time. I didn't have time. Mm. 
But today we've got some really great things that you can do with the kids and a couple that I'll share with you. You know, I started when my kids were younger, obviously. If I did it now, they'd roll their eyes and go. (laughs) But it's um, sitting at the table eating and asking everyone. So the parents have to model this. What were you grateful for today? And really listening to the answers. Another one is downloading an app like Smiling Minds that has fantastic mindful little meditations for for kids but also adults. But we read stories to kids at night time, do a meditation together because we know they really help us rewire the brain. So I think it's, you know, maybe also saying, look, life is busy don't be hard on yourself because we can't change a culture and society but we might say to our kids look this is going to be your time i'm giving you this Mm. time and try and really stick to it and even if it means look i'm no perfect mother far from it you know i've made some beauty bloopers but one thing i always did is the kids always demand from you around that peak hour i call it so i used to get my kids when they were little either in the high chair or put them up on the bench and give them things to help me make tea. You know, I may never have eaten their products, but, um, (laughs) you know, it just might be some flour and water, you know, that they feel like they're just part of that and put some music on and enjoy the peak hour time as much as you can, I guess. Mm, yeah, I love that. That sounds beautiful. I, I think I, I actually do enjoy most of the things you've said. So, but it's some, but not, but not daily. You know, I often don't do those things daily, and I think I probably could integrate at least one of those daily. It would be good. Yeah. So, thank you for that. That's okay. But I do want to put in a little disclaimer here. I think every parent, particularly single mums, you know, don't be too hard on yourself because the problem mm. isn't coming necessarily from you you're just doing the best you can in an environment that doesn't necessarily support you know stay-at-home mums or parents you know because it can be dads you know as well that you know doesn't really give the best daycare options and we do also have a culture of the we've lost a bit of the extended family you know before we had daycare we'd have grandmas and grandpas and and I kind of think we've lost a bit of that. And that's a bit sad in a way, you know. Yeah. I would love to do something where we can create some kind of tribal community feel for our kids yeah. because my family are, are interstate, so I, I live that. And I'm just watching my five-year-old single child growing up with that. I mean, she's got the, the neighbours, the, the kids, you know, on, on, the, on the street, which I'm grateful for and very fortunate enough to have. But... To have that next level of of wisdom that comes from our elders, I would love that. I just don't feel we have that enough. It could be a really fun program, you know, where you mm. adopt a grandparent, you know. And oh, I think I it, it's like some of the schools sort of do it, but I'm sure there's so many mm. people out there that don't have grandchildren that you know mm. could adopt a child, you know, oh, for just gosh, some special time. Yeah, well, let's write yeah, that on our to do list. I I was just, I was having a little giggle to myself because for the listeners that weren't here when we first connected on this podcast, just before we pressed record, we were laughing about us both being ideas people and very fiery and we just get stuff done. And so you put us together and here we are first time (laughs) together and we're already creating projects. Yeah, which is lovely. (laughs) I thought this might happen. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So I would love you to talk a little bit more about Art of the Minds because we haven't really looked at that yet. Tell us about what is that for those that don't know? Well, in 2015, I decided to disclose about my whole mental health journey, I thought, you know, and that was very much around being an educator because I'd I'd been an educator in the uh, field for longer than that. But I thought I've got to practice what I preach, you know, if we're going to be stigmatizing mental illness, why would I hide my own journey? And in actual fact, by sharing that, it's the best thing I can do for other people. But um, I had an art exhibition at Boom Gallery in Geelong with all my weird bird sculptures that kind of represented my futile attempt to find sanity, for want of a better word. 
uh, and also a friend did a photographic journal and and again you can find sort of that stuff it's a little video that they put together on the on my website but I thought I've I've been involved in exhibitions for years and to be quite honest you know often the opening night's a bit wanky you know people with their champagne walking around going lovely piece you know lovely so I thought, right, this is not going to be boring. So I got all my creative friends to do pop-up performances. So every oh. 10 minutes, a bell would ring and suddenly a live chicken came into the room and got everyone doing the German chicken dance. Then we had <laughs> yoga, champagne. We had someone just perform a song, someone do a live poetry read. I don't remember standing back going, wow, these people are actually talking about mental health, but they don't realise it. And that was the seed and that was it. And, you know, the following year I got a very small grant, did one community art exhibition and here we are. This year we ran 30 events in one week during National Mental Amazing. Health Week. Uh, we also run a great event called Her Story, which is just for women. That's coming up in May. Uh, a big fundraising ball because although we're a charity, we raise money for another uh, Alcohol and Drug Service Foundation 61, which is mm -hmm. uh, her story is all about the House of Hope and eight women, once that's open, which is early next year with substance use problems, can live there for a, a minimum, sometimes more, of six months to really look at embracing their substance use problems and two of those women can bring in young children. So that's wow. a really exciting adventure. So yeah. that was really the birth of Art of the Minds. And, and now community is slowly but surely, well, this year it was like boom, you know, getting involved. So we're always looking for committee members. If you want to join us, knock, knock. People, yeah. people that like taking minutes, all those sort of things as well. Yeah. Absolutely. I'll have to um, I'll have to put a little link. Uh, you've given me a lot of links that I want to share. So uh, we'll have to make sure I've got all those links for the listeners that they can click on yeah. and go through and find out more about these things. But we're very excited because we're in the finals for the Australian Community Charity Awards for Mental Health and Wellbeing. So we're off to the big gala ball wow. shortly. Amazing. Yeah. And I, That's fantastic. And I kind of think it doesn't really matter if we don't win. We've of won course. anyway, really. Yeah, yeah, of course. Goodies. You're doing so much already. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. And and I have to ask, laughter yoga. Tell me about this. Oh, and oh, oh, oh. I want to be a. Can we do a little tester here? Yeah, we can. <laughs> yeah, we can. Absolutely. Well, being very always curious, I, I tend to not get involved in anything if I can't get a spin off. And, you know, I was working for a company for many years and it was, I took my second long service this year and thought, oh, do I want to go back? And I sort of thought, no, time to just walk your independent sort of journey, which I've been doing. Uh, and I started um, getting a few friends saying, you should be a laughter yoga instructor. And I said, look, because I do deliver with a lot of humour. I, I like an interpretive yeah. dance, I must say. Yeah. And... Um, <laughs> I, I really didn't know much about it. I thought, you know, does that mean I become a comedian and crack jokes for an hour or something, which I'd be happy to do anyway. <laughs> and uh, so I started looking into it and um, have recently become a certified instructor. And I, I haven't started promoting that yet, but it works on the premise that when you do a fake laugh, like, ho, 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 your brain, that was my Santa laugh, oh, 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 oh. your brain, <laughs> it's very <hard> yeah, <laughs> your brain actually thinks it's a real laugh and starts to release feel-good chemicals like dopamine, endorphins, you know. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting. So I did more and more and more research and thought, that's it, I'm in. And so I guess what it is, is it's, it's about a pattern. Um, you laugh, then you clap. And then you breathe. So that's the yo particular yoga element. And when we laugh, we actually exhale, exhale and use our diaphragm. Because you can't laugh and breathe in. Try it at the same time. <laughs> you can't. Uh, and so you just go on a journey where, you know, you just take people through. It's a slow warm-up. And at first you might 
fake it till you make it, but it doesn't take very long for people to laugh because it's based on bringing the inner child out, eyeball contact, which is pretty funny to do when you're staring at someone who's, you know, going. <laughs> I'm already laughing. <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, it's oh, quite, it's so quite, good. and you leave feeling so incredible. Mm. Just like, mm. because here's the research that sold me. Children laugh on average 400 times a day, adults 15. Oh, we're so boring. Yeah, so something's gone wrong. Something's gone wrong. So even if we've got to, you know, fake it. And in India, they actually do laughing yoga every day. So I'll be offering it locally, you know, once a week. But if it takes off, I'll spend my whole week laughing, really. (laughs) So it's great. Well, show me, walk me through this. All right. Show me how we do it. Okay. um, We're going to, first of all, um, imagine that you are in your car driving. And if you like, you can simulate a steering wheel. And suddenly the kids in the back are screaming. And while I'm telling you this, I want you to smile. Do a fake smile. Oh, you are. Very good. The kids are screaming. And somebody's just pulled in front of you and slammed the brakes and you've hit them. Now start laughing. I feel like a psycho. (laughs) Oh, well, we won't keep going. And then after that, we do like a little clapping routine. Then we take some deep breaths. So there's no downward dogging, none of that sort of stuff, but it's the breath part of yoga. And then we go back into another cycle of laughing with a different scenario. So is the thinking there almost because you painted a picture that was quite stressful and that we'd normally like get on the horn and be shouting and then, you know, yeah. uh, and then the day's ruined yeah. and blah, blah, blah. Is there idea there to try and switch that, you know, so that when it happens, you'll start laughing? Or yeah, well, a, well, it was interesting know? that the second day of training, I was traveling in the car with my sister who came and did it with me. And she is the worst navigator in the world. And we were totally lost. Yeah. And she's barking away and in the end I thought, I'm not even going to listen to her. And we stopped at the stop lights and she's getting all upset. And I just started going. (laughs) (laughs) And and this is the amazing thing with laughter yoga and with all of us in general. We have um, what's called mirror neurons in our brain. So that's why we often start laughing when somebody else is laughing even though we don't necessarily know what they're laughing at. So it become it does become quite contagious and these mirror neurons go, oh, something's funny. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to keep laughing, you know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm crying. I've got, uh, I've got tears. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, that's very funny. So, sorry, my, my phone's ringing. I'm just trying. It's vibrating. Oh, while you're doing that, I'll phone. grab a copy. Yes. Yeah, and you do. Yeah. It is a little bit of an aerobic workout as well. So you're learning to really de- uh, breathe deeper, breathe with the diaphragm mm. because we often leave a lot of residual stale air, if you like, in our lungs. And the deeper mm. we breathe and work on an exhale, the better it is for us. You know, in terms of mm. what happens is our parasympathetic nervous system goes, ah, uh, that's, that's what we want. We want to end going, ah. Uh, yeah, I totally get that. I, not only am I crying from the sides of my eyes, but in a happy way, but uh, it does, it, it almost feels like my eyes are a bit brighter and, and I just feel like I've got a little bit more energy, you know, like I just feel a bit, even though I, I, I felt like I was a bit nuts, you know, laughing at <laughs> my kids screaming at me in the back. <laughs> it, it is kind of humorous. Like, what am I doing? This is kind of funny. Well, you'll have to try, you'll have to try it with the family later. Just, just laugh hysterically for Generally, it's a good 30 seconds that you need to, to laugh for. 30 seconds to a, mi- oh a minute, if you can hold a minute, is even better. I will, I'll test it out tonight. I'm pretty sure they're just going to look at me like, what, is, what, are you, what is wrong with you? <laughs> no, you might find okay, that. Yeah, challenge. yeah, go. Go for it. They'll join in, Let's I guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> so I would love to know, um, with Christmas fast approaching, it's, it's just around the corner, what have you got any tips about getting through the hectic 
Christmas period, if someone's really struggling, what, have you got any tips to get through? Because it's such a crazy time. Well, it, it, it can be a really tough time for people who are mentally isolated. I think, you know, what we've done for a couple of years is we've got a, a lovely Dutch family and their kids who have had no family here. So it's become a tradition now. They just come and have Christmas Day with us. So I think if you know someone that's that's isolated, you know, really extend that if you do do something. But I kind of think, you know, we have to really tap into what your beliefs about Christmas are. Um, is it about the gift giving? Mm, maybe. Mm. But, you know, and, and there is something very pleasurable about giving people a gift. They say it can be quite more, actually more powerful than receiving a gift. But, you know, it is that time of connection. And I think, you know, Try not to overextend yourself because suddenly you've got 5,000 Christmas parties happening. You know, it is okay to say no and not make excuses and just say no. I, you know, as much as we'd like to be there, we just, I just want to slow my life down a little bit, you know, not get knotted mm -hmm. up in the extremes of connection. Like connection is fantastic, but it can get out of hand at Christmas. Mm. Gosh, I know it is, it is, isn't it? And, and I'm right there with you. I, I would love to have the opportunity to invite people into my home for Christmas. Unfortunately, I actually leave, leave uh, Torquay and, and head home to Adelaide. So not quite the same there, but maybe next year I'll think about that. So um, is there anything else that you'd like to share? Well, I guess uh, I'd really love to encourage, you know, um, women to come to the Her Story event at Mount Denis. That's a really beautiful mm -hmm day that we have, um, which is coming up in May the 26th, 2024. Mm -hmm. uh, but the best thing is, is to go to the Art of the Minds website and subscribe to our newsletter. You only get a, a new, an email when the event's sort of coming up for ticket booking purposes. But the last thing is really um, a self-compassion exercise that when you're feeling really overwhelmed, so if you're feeling really down or highly strung practice this as many times as you can because women love to be self-critical that's a bit of the notion of i think anxiety as well with our ruminating you know self-critical mm -hmm. thoughts that can happen and what you need to do is you find a word to name how you're feeling so it might be i feel overwhelmed you know, that's the word or it might be i feel unloved that's the word. Then the second step is to say to yourself, I need to remember that all over the world, right now, there are women everywhere feeling overwhelmed. All over the world, there's women feeling unloved. And then the third step is to imagine that you are now your best friend and say something to yourself that you would say to your best friend. And it's a really great way to start to change our thinking about some self-love and self-compassion for ourselves. So it might be, you know, ranging from, you know, for me, I, I'm a, a Christian and I don't care because that's who I am in this political world. We shouldn't talk about things. But <laughs> for me, my third line, when I'm feeling really overwhelmed, after I've reminded myself that there's mothers everywhere feeling overwhelmed, is I just say to myself, oh, well, God's got this, you know, and that's enough to give me comfort, but it would be, have to be a line specific to you, you know, that would yeah. give you comfort. I like that. That's beautiful. Thank you for that. That's very nice. Okay. So we're going to do a quick fire round. So tell me your favorite. Do I need a buzzer? It doesn't have, this is, oh, have you got one? That would be, that would be fun. <laughs> Oh, I'm surprised it's not a laughing buzzer. <laughs> oh, okay. So off you go. <laughs> You're going to choose the buzzer. Okay. So tell me, oh, tell me your favorite book. It doesn't have to be of all time. It could just be right now. The Magic Faraway Tree. Oh, beautiful. Very nice. That brings me back. What are you trying to unlearn? Not to be... If I'm overwhelmed, to be self-critical. Best advice about happiness that you've ever been given? 
that doesn't involve illicit substances and alcohol. (laughs) It is if we learn to love ourselves unconditionally, warts and all, uh, and that can take practice and time. That's probably it. You know, be really forgiving on yourself. Mm, very nice. If you could wave a fairy wand, what would you change about the world? In the context of our conversation, I mean, there's lots of things I'd love to change, but in the context of our conversation, I would change how society puts too much pressure on young parents to not be there for their little ones. Mm. You know? Yeah. That would be it. And f- And finally, tell us one practical tool that we can put into practice today that can help us achieve more happiness. Love. And I know you've, yeah, good. Well, we did the self-compassion one. Yes. So you got that one. Everyone can keep practicing it. And it it, it actually is really good. I will throw in another one. Write it down. Because they've proven that when we write, it helps shift emotions. Mm. And you don't have to show that to anyone. You can throw it out. You can do whatever, but get it out, you know. Or Mm. particularly if you don't feel like talking to someone and it's quite intimate, you know. Mm. So good. Thank you. I have one final question from you. Who would you say if, I mean, obviously you can talk specifically to our community or people wherever they're listening. What would be the first step if someone's really struggling? What was the, what's the first step? Who do they go to? Is there someone they can call or is there a first port of call? Well, it's, you know, do they look up the yellow pages or what do they do? Well, in, in terms of any sort of um, violation or abuse, the sexual assault unit, I think is a really good place to start. Um, but I think, you know, just finding a doctor and think about the gender. For some people, they're more comfortable ringing some of the helplines. So if you go to the, the website called Head to Health, it has you know, free call numbers for people with eating disorders, which is something that sort of I struggled with when I was younger. Um, eating disorders, men's helplines, children's helplines, you know, there's so many at the Head to Health site. Um, and, and know that you actually don't have to see a doctor today. A lot of them will do tele telehealth and people find that mm. a bit more safe. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Jules. You have been such a joy, literally, um, figuratively. We, you've been an absolute joy making me laugh and oh. no doubt all of the listeners. Hopefully they're all sitting in the car as they're listening laughing as well. Um, so remember, don't have road rage, just laugh. Yeah, <laughs> bring out that. My children call it the high in a laugh. That's when they know I'm laughing. Some of the snorters <laughs> out there, you would know what your snort laugh is. Yep, they're the good laughs. Mm-hmm. Yep. I have a I have a one snort every now and again laugh, I must admit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And I look forward to, to seeing all of these things come out again as, a, you know, whether it's your program or your laughter yoga, and, and I'm sure I'm going to join. So thank you so much. Sounds wonderful. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. What a joy, Jules is. I hope you had a moment of laughter there with us. Here's the takeaways. Importance of connection in healing. Connection is essential for healing from mental illness, whether through support groups, community programs, or simple one-on-one interactions. Connecting plays a significant role in mental well-being. Vulnerability and sharing. Jules shares her personal journey of overcoming trauma and stresses the importance of being vulnerable and open about mental health experiences. And she highlights the power of sharing stories as it can help individuals to feel less alone, encouraging them to really seek help. Taking responsibility for mental health. Jules encourages individuals to take responsibility for their mental health. And this includes seeking help, experimenting with different strategies and being proactive in managing one's well-being. The journey may involve relapses, but taking steps toward improvement is really vital. The importance of self-compassion. 
Jules emphasizes the significance of practicing self-compassion, especially during challenging times. She suggests a practical exercise where individuals can name their feelings, recognize that others around the world may share in that similar emotion, and then provide themselves with the same kindness and understand that they would offer that to a friend, so why not to themselves? And this lesson really underscores the value of self-love and forgiveness. Laughter as a tool for well-being. Jules advocates for the power of laughter as a tool for mental well-being. She encourages the concept of laughter yoga, explaining how laughter, even if initially forced, can trigger the release of feel-good chemicals in the brain. And this lesson encourages individuals to incorporate laughter into their lives as a simple yet effective means of improving mood. So thank you for being here with me today. Please, if you are struggling with your mental health, speak to your doctor or call a friend and all my love to you. Until next time, remember you are loved and you are worthy. I'm Nicole Sharonum. See you next week.